Amen. I want to thank my wife for that special on the piano. Does Jesus care? Well, all you have to do is turn to Genesis chapter 3, and you're going to find out he does. In fact, as you turn to Genesis 3 right now, I would say this, that if anyone wants to find out what went wrong in this world, you don't have to really look any further than Genesis 3, because all that's gone wrong is traceable to a satanic trap of temptation that the human couple fell head first into. I already have read in our scripture reading this morning the first six verses, and so I'm not going to repeat that. And really, the first six verses probably are more familiar to believers than the rest of the chapter. And uh, that's a focus for another time. What I'd like to do is, first of all, ask you a question. Why did God allow it? And the answer to that question is free will. God does not want people to be passive, robotic, compliant in their obedience. God wants human obedience to him to be a personal choice of love. And if obedience isn't the result of a personal, deliberate choice to obey God, then I would say it's not really obedience at all. What Adam and Eve did in Genesis chapter 3 plunged the human race, plunged the world into total chaos. And there are three kinds of chaotic uh, results that are injected into human life, into our world, that are seen here. And I think that all three of them are an illustration of the prohibition that God gave to Adam in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17, when he forbid him to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he said, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Or literally, dying thou shalt die. In other words, the process of death will begin, and it will come to a completion. I believe that what happened as a result of uh, the first six verses in Genesis 3 is an illustration, then, of what spiritual death that God said would ensue really looks like. And I want to share those things with you, but let's just pause a moment and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have a big problem in our world, in our lives. And we know that that problem originates right here in the third chapter of Genesis. And we are the children of Adam and Eve. And Lord, we have inherited their nature, which is a sinful nature. And so we need something radical that you would uh, bring to us as a cure, as a remedy for our sin sickness that brings death. So Lord, we pray today that you would just speak to our hearts from your word and that you would, you would give, uh, Lord, clear instruction and uh, bring conviction. And most importantly, Lord, would you then bring change into the hearts of those that are listening. We thank you that you've not left us here in the condition that we're in to just simply die in our sin but you have given to us the hope of life and that eternal if we will but embrace you and your wonderful plan of redemption that we've already talked about your atonement so we just ask that you would make this clear and do it all for your glory for your name's sake we pray in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Amen. I want to uh, share with you, first of all, uh, beginning in the eighth verse, I believe what is the first and the greatest impact that has come as a result of what took place 
in Genesis 3, verses 1 to 6. And that is the impact that it had on mankind in the spiritual realm. If you look at verse 8, it says, And they, that is Adam and Eve, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Human beings are created by God in his image, and they have been created as a three-part being. Body, soul, and spirit. In their body, they have the means whereby they can function in a physical, earthly environment that we live in. In their soul, they're able to have self-consciousness and, uh, and connect with other human beings and with their world in general. But in the spirit of man, God puts the potential of real connection with himself. God created human beings to be spiritually fully connected to God's spirit. Originally created in perfect fellowship with God. We see that implied in that eighth verse, that there was a daily walking with God on the part of this first human couple. But because of what took place in the first six verses, because they disobeyed that one command and ate that uh, forbidden fruit, whatever it was, from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, something awful happened in the spiritual realm. And you see it pictured in that eighth verse where they are evading God. They're evasive. They're running from God. You know, running from God is just a natural human sinful response. But when you look what God does, they're running from him. They're hiding um, amongst the trees in the garden. And in verse 9, God calls out to Adam and says, Where art thou? And I am convinced in thinking about this, that when God says, where art thou, it's not the, it's not the word of a dictator, but it is the, it's the broken heart of a lover. I don't think he said, okay, Adam, where are you? I think he said, Adam, where are you? He knew where he was, but he was heartbroken over the, the fellowship that was severed as a result. And Adam, instead of welcoming God, is evading him. In fact, look at verse 10. Adam speaks and says, I heard, I heard the voice in the garden. I heard your voice. And I was afraid. That had never happened before. I was afraid. That's the first mention of fear in the Bible. Instead of as normal as in the past, welcoming daily fellowship with the Creator, with God, now Adam is slinking away. And uh, uh, previously, he was glad to walk with the Lord. But now he's hiding from God. When sin enters the human race, there is an evasion. There is a hiding from God. God then becomes not your friend, but he becomes your enemy. You're afraid of God because you know because he made you, he has the right to judge you. And unless perfect love exists, fear takes its place. So he's afraid. And not only that, in that 10th verse, if you look again at the Bible, he says, I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. He was not only afraid, but he evaded God because he was ashamed. I think that this is the saddest moment in human history because they eat that fruit and they expect tremendous results to come of it, and instead there's a huge wave of shame that sweeps over them and completely engulfs them. And when he says, I was ashamed, 
That's the reaction of a guilty conscience. But I want to say there's hope. But look again. In verse 11 and 12, God speaks up and says, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I have commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And look at the man's response in the 12th verse. And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. He evades God. He's afraid of God. He's ashamed before God. And he accuses God. You say, I don't see that. When we refuse to take personal responsibility for our sin. We blame God. And blaming God is a very familiar defense mechanism in human beings. It's a very familiar coping mechanism that we have to project all that is wrong with us on God. That's what's going on here. He says, the woman that you gave me she gave me of the fruit, and I ate it. In other words, God, it's your fault. It's your fault. He evades God. And then look at what the Lord does. The Lord says in verse 15, I will put enmity, that's hostility, between thee. He's talking to the woman, by the way. I will put hostility between you. Or, I mean, he's talking to the serpent. I will put hostility between you, the serpent, which Satan used, and the woman, and between thy seed, that's the seed of the serpent, Satan, and her seed, the seed of the woman. And then notice the personal pronouns. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And what we have here is in the spiritual realm, there is enmity. God is the one that imposes it. God causes endless hostility of human beings towards Satan. And it is climaxed in a specific human seed of the woman who guarantees the ultimate victory over Satan himself. That's what verse 15 is all about. Some call that the first uh, proclamation of the gospel. It is the gospel in a nutshell. It's the first implication and hint of a redeemer, of this one who will provide the atonement. It is a prophecy that, that uh, is fulfilled in Messiah Jesus, who is the seed of the woman that crushes the head of Satan. There's another thing that I wanted you to note that impacted human beings in the spiritual realm. Not only did he evade God, not only was there enmity then established between uh, Satan and human beings, but also they're evicted. They're evicted. Look at uh, verse 23 and 24, last two verses. The Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till uh, the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims with a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. I want you to, to uh, note verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become, as notice this, one of us not the first time that the plural is used for God in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis. But that is very clear a reference to the triunity of God. And the triune God is sad that he must expel this human couple from paradise in order to cut them off from the tree of life because the tree of life had the power to impart immortality and God didn't want them confirmed in sin forever. 
And so actually to evict them from the Garden of Eden is an act of mercy on God's part. He's being merciful to them. And that tells me there's hope. But there's a second area that is impacted by the sin of this first couple. Not only in spiritual realm, but in personal relations. And I said last time that the main part of life is about relationships. And if we fail there, that's the worst kind of failure we can have. And we have been created by God in his image as social beings that need fellowship. We need fellowship with God. We need fellowship with each other. We need love relationships. Those relationships of love are important. There must be harmony in them. That's why the home is so vital in our lives. There has to be harmony in a home. That's the most important human relationship that we have. But through sin, personal relations were harmed. They were deeply and negatively impacted. For instance, look at verse 7. The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Their innocence was taken. Their innocence in their personal relations with each other. They lost that God-given characteristic of innocence, and they became self-conscious, and so they covered themselves. You know what self-consciousness is? It's a prideful self-focus. That's what it is. And it came about as a result of sin. It is not humility. It is prideful self-focus when we become self-conscious. And here we see the first hint of that. But that's not all that happened in their personal relationships. Not only was their innocence taken, but in their personal relations, conscience was, uh, uh, was uh, enacted. Look at verse 12. The man, again, using excuse, says, The woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me of the fruit, and I ate of it. Again, a reaction of a guilty conscience. That's what it is. And uh, he is, in a cowardly way, refusing to admit personal guilt that he felt. And he is shifting blame. And whenever we blame shift, ultimately we're blaming God. And that's exactly what we see, again, in this 12th verse. So in personal relations, innocence is taken. Uh, conscience is, uh, is enacted. And then look at verse 16. Here, God is speaking to the woman, and he says to her, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. There is also the issue of dominance in personal relations. Here is the whole beginning of the gender battle for control and specifically in a marriage in a home this is where it deeply impacts marriage relationships and it all harkens back to this very verse and then there's a third and final area that uh, is impacted by the fall of adam and eve in sin in their disobedience to god and that is what I call the area of just physical realities. And I find it in verses 16 to 19, uh, how that the human race, through this, entered into suffering. There's affliction in that 16th verse that we just read. It says that he, he would mul greatly multiply her sorrow, which is the word for pain. And it, and it refers to everything that is hard to, to, to bear in life that, of course, contains sorrow. In other words, one of the physical realities would be that human beings would suffer affliction, and particularly it's uh, directed here to the woman in this passage, but it refers to the whole human race. Affliction would enter into our lives, and there would be hurting, 
there would be painful physical infirmities. And specifically in the woman, it is referred to her in pregnancy and in childbirth. There would be painful physical uh, results that go along with it. There would be hurting. But also in verse 16, uh, it says, And thy desire shall be to thy husband. They will be, there will be longing. That uh, there will be a natural and a continual desire in women for a husband. In other words, the very source, isn't that ironic, that, uh, w that has the power to bring on your suffering in uh, pregnancy and childbirth is the thing that you long for the most. So there's affliction that involves hurting and longing, and then in that last phrase of verse 16, and he, being the husband, shall rule over thee. There is controlling. There is that, uh, that uh, affliction, if you would call it that, that the wife is to be under the submission or the rule of her husband in the right sense. So affliction. Another physical reality brought by sin in this human race, found in uh, verse 17 through 19, look at Adam. Now God's speaking to Adam. And uh, he says in the second part of verse 17, Thou, uh, thou shalt not, uh, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat thy bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, and for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. There is exhaustion there. The physical reality of not only affliction, but exhaustion, where there is a painful misery that will accompany even eking out a living on this planet. And then the final physical reality that I see that uh, impacted human life because of their sin, not only affliction and exhaustion, but separation found in the last part of that 19th verse where it talks about death. Not just physical separation from the body, which is what physical death is, but physical separation from paradise, right? Verses 23 and 24. And along with that, a spiritual separation from God. This is what is involved in this whole thing of death. Well, in closing, what is God's response then? What is God's response to this human calamity, to this chaos injected into our world, into human life? Well, go back to verse 9 with me. And there I see God calling. There I see God, I see his grace. I see God's response is a deep, heartfelt cry to draw man out of hiding from God, to bring man back to himself, back to God. That's God's response. Not only that, but in verse 11, God confronts Adam, and he confronts him with convicting questions. Why? To bring the obstacles out in the open. What did you do? What's wrong with you? in order to be able to deal with those obstacles. And so when God asks those convicting questions to our heart, it's a blessing because he's not asking us convicting questions so that he can then condemn us, but so he can bless us with forgiveness. And then look at the third response of God in verse 21. And unto Adam and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them? In other words, he meets immediately the physical needs of these two people to be covered, to cover their nakedness, and also to protect them from the climate outside of the Garden of Eden, out of paradise. Um, and so Adam and Eve had already made for themselves uh, coverings out of fig leaves. But their personal 
sewing together of fig leaves was inadequate. I don't know. Uh, maybe the climate was so harsh outside of the Garden of Eden that those fig leaves would not have kept them warm. And so God provides them adequate uh, uh, covering. God provides them suitable covering. That's what that's about, verse 21. But I think in that that there is a hint for us. I think in that verse there is a hint that God provides not only physical covering for mankind, but God provides covering for the human soul. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, we read the prophet saying these words, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses, you might say mixed vote, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. In other words, we need other clothing. We need another covering. We need an atonement. We need an atonement that only God himself can provide. We can't provide it for ourselves. And just as God provided them warm uh, and, and the suitable clothing for their physical need, God provides in Jesus the Messiah a covering of his own righteousness to cover our souls as an atonement for sin. He suffered as our sacrifice. He bled. He died. He gave his life because the wages of sin is death. The day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He took our death as our sacrifice and wove for us then that clothes of righteousness. I read of a, a newly saved person who stood up in church and was giving his testimony, and with a smile on his face and joy in his heart, he related how God had delivered him from a, a life of sin, and he gave God all the glory, saying nothing about his own merits or what he had done to deserve the blessings of God's salvation. Another person that was in the audience hearing uh, the man didn't really appreciate uh, salvation by grace through faith alone. And uh, so he said to the man afterwards, he said, well, you seem to indicate that, that, uh, that God did everything when he saved you. Uh, didn't you do anything on, on your part? Uh, God did it all? And uh, he said, uh, oh, yeah. He said, I did my part. He said, for more than 30 years, I was running from God as fast as my sins could carry me. That was my part. But God took out after me, and he ran me down, and that was his part. I was speaking to a man recently who was uh, speaking negatively of God. He said, if there is a God, then where is he? Why is he allowing all this to happen? It's like he's absent on the job. Like, uh, if he created all of this, then he must have ran away from it. And I'm praying under my breath, Lord, give me a wise answer here. And I said, oh, no, no, you got it just the op you got it backwards. It's just the opposite of that. It's not that God has been running away from his world, but you have been running away from him. And I want to tell you, you may be running from God this very moment. You're not going to get very far. You say, oh, I've been ignoring God for all of my life. Well, let me read to you from the book of the Psalms, just a couple of verses. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in the grave, thou art there. I, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. You think you're fast enough to run from God? Jewish people are rejecting Messiah Jesus, and they're running from God in that way. And yet the end of the book of Romans says that God has continued to stretch out his arms to a, a gainsaying people. Jewish people are running from God in rejecting Jesus, their Messiah. 
I remember the story of what is called the prodigal son. He ran away from his dad. And that's a picture of people running away from God. And when he came to his senses and he went, turned to his dad, guess what? He found out that his dad was running toward him. Whoever you are, if you're running from God, stop it. Turn around and look, and you're going to see that he's been pursuing you all along. And you're going to see that he is running after you with, with open arms. You're going to see that he's welcoming you. It's God's, it's God's heart that's broken in which he's calling out to you, where are you? He knows where you are. But do you know where you are? He's ready to forgive you. He's ready to receive you into his family if you'll receive what he has done for you when he paid your sin price on that tree. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, I do ask that you might uh, save souls through this message this morning and that you might draw people into the welcoming arms of the God of heaven through the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel, and the Savior of the world. I pray that you would, uh, that people would stop running from you and run to you into your wide open arms that will welcome them. And I pray this in the name of Jesus.